you may be asking this question. How is it that some people seem that they just love church? How is it that some people, they don't complain about church? They, uh, they just, it's just a part of who they are. How can I love church that much? You, you ever see people like that and you're like, man, I wish I could have some of that. And I'm going to tell you the secret. Because here's the thing. We all are going to be tempted to be dissatisfied. After a while, no matter how great the music is, no matter how great the programming is, no matter how great the children's ministry is or the, the youth ministry is, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, uh, you, you know, man, I wish I could uh, ha- have a little better experience. Or I, I wish I liked it a little bit more. Or you're going to hear something or see something that's going to make you feel like, eh, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I want to go. How many of you would like to know the secret to not ever oversleeping on Sunday? I'm talking to those of you online, all right? Uh, how, how would you like to know the secret of that you're so excited about coming to church that you don't have to even set your alarm clock, but you're going to get up and you're going to be there and you're going to love it? I'm going to tell you what it is. Stop coming for yourself and start coming for somebody else. You see, if it's all about me, then it doesn't take very long before I find something that I don't like. You know why? Because, you know, our our series is called Embrace the Mess. Life is messy. There's nobody that's perfect. We say things like this, Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. And the problem with that statement is that all the people here are imperfect. And there's going to be somebody that makes you mad or... They're going to aggravate you or they're going to say something that offends you. And if you want to know the secret to being able to love coming to church and to love Jesus more and to be excited about it, stop coming for yourself and start coming for somebody else. It is only then that you begin to discover the great purpose of the Christian life. And when you begin to discover that great purpose, it changes everything. You see, it's no longer about whether or not you liked a particular song, because we all have songs that we like better than others, and we all have styles that we like better than others. And it's not about whether or not you like the way the pastor dresses, which I'm sure that's not a problem here at Avalon Church, because I don't even have any socks, all right? So that can't be offensive to anybody. I don't know why I did that, but uh, the older I get, the less hair I have on my legs. I don't know what in the world. I don't shave my legs, I promise, all right? Uh, that by, I used to mock my dad. My dad's legs, I'm like, Dad, it looks like you shave your legs. He goes, no, you know, just get older, the hair falls off. I'm like, no, that's like off the head, right? Because my dad's bald, shaves his head. But no, I, I, it's the legs too. I, I do not know why. Uh, But nevertheless, back to what I was talking about, the fact is, if you want to fall in love with Jesus, it's not about the pastor dresses, it's not about the style, or even what the auditorium looks like, or the lights, or the video, or any of that stuff. Now, that stuff's important. Listen, you want to fall in love with it, stop coming for yourself. Start coming for somebody else. Because when you serve, guess what? You know what? I talked to... You know, my wife, she uh, directs the children's ministry, and there's so many people back there that are volunteering, just doing an awesome job. They knock the ball out of the park every week. And my wife, I promise, if you were to go to lunch with us after church, and if you're buying, we're going, all right? So uh, I'm just kidding, because some of you are going to buy, and I don't want to go with you, all right? I'm just being honest, all right? So I'm just teasing, all right? So, uh, but... You, you, you would notice that this woman talks so much about how much she loves these kids. And she talks about what they do and how they act and the funny things they say and the ones that get saved and who needs to get baptized. You, you know what she's discovered? It ain't about her. She stopped coming a long time ago for, somebody, for herself and started coming for somebody else. You want to find out how 
to be so excited about God and your relate. You want a new passion. You want a new injection of energy about church. Stop coming for yourself. Start coming for somebody else. Well, today we started a new series called Embrace the Mess, and we're going to look at several stories from the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at several uh, life stories, life lessons that Jesus talked about. And uh, I was thinking about this this week. This series is for everybody, no matter what your age. You know, as you're younger, there are certain things you deal with in a certain way. As you get older, sometimes those things aren't the same. They're still there, but they're just different. Uh, For example... Um, there are some things you're tempted by when you're younger that you're maybe not tempted by quite as much as you get older. There are some things that really, really tempt you when you're young that as you get older, you're probably like, eh, I can do without that. That doesn't really bother me at all. And there are some things that don't bother you too much when you're young that you're really bothered by when you get older. And so this series is going to be for everybody. We're going to, today we're talking about handling temptation. But we're also going to talk about, next week, dealing with offensive people. Now, we live in a culture that everybody gets offended about everything. How do you deal with that? What does the Bible say about it? How do you deal with others, offensive people, in a culture like the one that we live in? There's some things that are not as offensive to you when you're young, and they are more so as you get older. Some things don't bother you as much when you're young, and they bother you as you get older. How many had a dad or a grandpa that used to say things like this? Well, back when I was your age, anybody know what I'm talking about? Back when I was your age, I promise you my grandpa, when I would work on the farm, back when he was my age, he was uh, eight feet tall, and could lift uh, 5,000 pounds over his head with one pinky, and could work 82 hours a day and never get tired. He didn't even stop for water. Uh, He didn't stop to eat. He didn't even have to wear shoes. That's what it seems like, right? And, And, you know, a lot of times as we get older, we look back on things, then we see things differently. We perceive things differently. And so we're going to talk about dealing with marital conflict, We're going to talk about handling hurt. We're going to talk about building wealth, your attitude toward money. And then we're going to talk about something that everybody needs. And you need to understand, particularly our young people, I want you to hear me. And I love you and I'm so glad that you're a part of our church. Young people often think about judging others in a way that is not biblical. You say, what do you mean? Well, in our culture, we get this tendency to think that uh, judging others means that you can make no moral judgment. Now, there's a difference between being judgmental and being able to judge what is right and wrong, okay? We're never to be judgmental. We're never to be holier than thou. We're never to pretend that we don't sin while everybody else does. We're never to do that. But we are to make judgments about things in life because you can't live without doing that. In fact, the very ironic thing about many young people with their attitude about judging others, they're like, well, I can't stand it when people judge others. That is a judgment in and of itself, which is so ironic. But then as we get older, we tend to be very critical. And we can look at things, well, I tell you about when I was growing up, that's not the way it was. Let me tell you the way it was back when I, you know. And you don't remember that you hated it when you were growing up. And uh, so we need to learn from Scripture what Jesus said about judging others. But today we're going to talk about handling temptation. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever been tempted to do something that you knew you should not do, but you did it anyway? Let's just get an honesty assessment here. How many have ever been tempted to do something you knew you shouldn't have done and you did it anyway? All right. 99% of you are paying attention. The rest of you are on your phone and not paying attention, right? So everybody should raise their hand because we've all been tempted to do things that we know that we should not do. Uh, I was thinking about this uh, this week. Uh, as you've heard me talk about a lot before, my grandpa, in fact, both of my grandpas had farms 
And I grew up in North Carolina, worked on those farms a lot growing up. And uh, my grandpa, Phillips, my mom's dad, he had not just tobacco and all the crops that he grew, but he also had cattle and horses and pigs and just all kinds of animals. And it was, uh, it was a wonderful thing to be able to look back and remember that. It was a lot, a lot of fun. But my grandpa had cattle and he had a lot of pastures. But in this one particular pasture, pasture there was an electric fence. I mean, you know what an electric fence is. You know what I'm talking about? Electric fence is you, it'll shock a cow to keep it inside the fence so it doesn't wander off, get run over, hurt, killed, whatever. Um, and uh, it doesn't harm them. It just like shocks them uh, enough to keep them from wanting to do it again. Now, for some reason, and I know what the reason was, my uncles dared me to do this, but for some reason I was so tempted to touch the electric fence. Now, now, let me be honest with you. That wasn't my finest moment, all right? I'm going to admit that. But when I say things like I was tempted to do things that I knew I should not have done, that seemed like the story of my entire childhood growing up. You know, I was just always tempted to do things that I should not do. And you probably know what that feels like as well. But I, I remember... Uh, them standing, my uncle's standing there. Oh, it won't hurt. Oh, you ought to try it. It's a lot of fun. And I was just so badly wanted to touch that electric fence. And, you know, in my little pea brain that was 10 years old, I had no, I, there was no way that I had this thought that if this fence was powerful enough to shock a 2,000 pound bull, and keep it in the fence that maybe an 85-year-old, 85-pound, uh, 10-year-old probably should not touch that fence. Uh, 85, I don't know how much I weighed. I just guessed that that is somewhere in there, right? But I remember them daring me. And, you know, that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. They didn't just dare me. They double-dog dared me. Anybody ever been double-dog dared? You know what I'm talking about? I got double-dog dared. And so in my little tiny pea brain at 10 years old, I decided I knew I shouldn't do it. I knew it was not going to turn out right. I reached out and grabbed a hold of that electric fence. Now, you have to understand something. When I first grabbed it, it didn't hurt at all. And there's a reason for that. Because this electric fence was not one that stayed on the entire time, but it pulsed. It'd be like, bzzz, 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 and I could hear it, okay, but I was too dumb to realize that, you know, you should touch it when it's not going, bzzz, and you should not touch it when it's going, bzzz, you know, so I reached out, and I was like, well, this doesn't hurt at all. Now, I'll say this. I never touched an electric fence again. But I did give in to other temptations, and uh, you know, you and I, we get tempted to do things. And we know that we shouldn't do it, but we do it anyway. We get tempted to lie. You know that's not going to work out, right? I mean, you know that's not going to work out. When you lie, you always have to tell another lie to get out of that lie. Lying doesn't work. We, we're tempted to lust. We give in to pride. We give in to selfishness, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. I got to be honest with you, uh, the, the, the group that's been meeting at 6 o'clock for prayer, um, we've shared something, and, and, and one of the guys shared this with me this morning, actually, uh, that he said, you know, that he normally has road rage. Normally, he really bothers him, but somebody goes to pass him on a double yellow line in uh, in being filled with the Spirit, he speeds up so that they cannot get by him. Anybody ever done something like that? Like somebody trying to cut you? Anybody ever seen one of these people? You're in line, uh, traffic is backed up, and they're like pulling along the shoulder, just like, blah, 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 you know, running along. And what do you do? Do you, in kindness and love, say, oh, yes, you can go right in front of me? Or do you almost hit the bumper in front of you to keep them from getting in? I know what it's like, you know. Like, well, that's not fair. Okay. Well, 
you probably ought not let, to, let something that simple ruin your day. But he's talking about how that, you know, normally uh, things like that bother him. But on the way to church to pray this morning, somebody cut him off. And he was shocked because he'd been fasting and praying this week. He said, I was shocked that I didn't react. And I just didn't let it bother me. I'm like, yeah, I know exactly how you feel. I had the same thing on the way to church this morning. And uh, I did not react negatively either, and normally I do. All right, and I'm just being honest. You know, I realize I'm a pastor, and I preach and teach the Word of God, and I'm filled with the Spirit of God. But there are times that I will cut you off, all right, that's all I'm saying. And I will say things to you that you cannot hear, even though I say it like you do here. And so we have these temptations to neglect our relationship with God for envy and unkindness. And I could go on. It's not about naming a list of temptations. But I want to read to you today a passage from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And this is about the temptation of Jesus. Some of you may not know that Jesus himself was tempted. Now, Jesus was the perfect son of God. Now, he was fully human. That's why he was tempted. But he was also fully God. So Jesus did not sin. He never sinned even once, not even a little bit. But even he was tempted, and he did this as an example so that we could follow it. So let's begin reading in verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I would say that would be an understatement. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written. And if you want to deal with temptation, you and I need to learn how to do that. Use the Bible to combat these temptations. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. By the way, did you notice how the devil twisted? Jesus said it was written. You see what the devil did? Oh, yeah, the Bible says. And did you know that for most things in your life, you can twist Scripture. Now, that's not what it means, but you can twist Scripture or some kind of religious ritual or some kind of tradition. You can twist it and make it fit what you want to do. That's what the devil did here. He said, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the angel took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, to him, it, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. For it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I want to give you one more passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And this, is, um, this goes along with what we're talking about today, how Jesus dealt with temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. In other words, all he's saying is everybody else has been tempted. Now, not everybody gets tempted in the same way you do, at the same level you do, maybe. There are some things that are, are tempting to me, then uh, there are other things that are not. There are some things that I just don't get bothered by. It just doesn't really ha carry any interest for me. And that, but then there are other sins that I'm tempted to do that, boy, they, they are very interesting to me. I want to do it in my flesh. So he said, uh, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. Everybody else feels what you feel. God is faithful. God is faithful. That's a good principle to remember. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. You ever just say things like, well, I just can't, I just can't resist that. Not according to that. 
God will never, by the way, temptation does not come from God. But he knows that we get tempted, so he will not let any temptation come into our life beyond our ability to say no. He said, but will with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I want you to notice the little word able, A-B-L-E, able. Uh, Because of Jesus, you are able to overcome. Because of Jesus, he has promised that you are able. Our word for uh, 2022 is the word promise. And Jesus promised that you are able to overcome. Because of Jesus, I am able. I want you to say that with me. Ready? Because of Jesus, I am able. I want you to say it again. Because of Jesus, I am able. Now, I don't normally do this, but to help you remember these four principles I want to give you today, I want to use a little acrostic, A-B-L-E. God says, I am able. Through the power of Jesus, I'm able to overcome. Here's the word, the letter A. That is the word aware, aware. If Jesus, the perfect, sinless, infallible Son of God, was aware of the power of temptation, then don't you think that you and I must be aware of it as well? Shouldn't we be aware? You know, here's the thing about being aware. Sometimes awareness keeps us from going to the place that we shouldn't go. You see, if I'm aware, let me just use an example. Uh, let's say that you struggle with drinking too much and there was a time in your life maybe that you were an alcoholic, you were addicted, and uh, you've quit drinking. And uh, I applaud you for that. That's a wonderful thing. Um, but let me just tell you that if you're aware that that's a weakness of yours of drinking too much, then my suggestion to you is not have your small group meet in a bar. All right? Does that make sense? So, you know, I mean, if you're aware, uh, if you're aware of your weakness, maybe your weakness is you're tempted sexually or you're tempted with lust. Can I just tell you that maybe God has not called you to a ministry to the strippers in downtown Atlanta? Now, let somebody else do that, okay? Do those people need to be ministered to? Yes. But maybe you don't have Bible study at uh, one of the strip clubs in Atlanta. That's all I'm saying, all right? You know what that is? That's awareness. I must be aware. Now, here's what you need to understand. Temptation is not a sin. Just because you get tempted to do something doesn't mean that you're broken doesn't mean that you are not right with God. If Jesus was tempted, well, we get tempted too. Listen to Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. That is why we have a great high priest who has gone to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us cling to him and never stop trusting him. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same temptations we do, Yet he did not sin. Isn't that amazing? Jesus was tempted, but he didn't sin. And because of that, you and I don't have to sin either. Temptation is not a sin. But I want you to understand this. Even though temptation is not a sin, you are not exempt. Now, we might think we are. Oh, I I would never fall to that. You ever hear somebody say that? I would never do that. Be careful what you say. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. When I become confident in God and I am aware that temptation can trip me up and I depend on him, then I'm confident in him, not in my own strength. Proverbs 6, 27, can a man scoop fire into his lap and not be burned? And his point is, don't hang out, don't expose yourself to the areas of your greatest temptation. Just say, you know what? No. Sometimes 
we overcome temptation by not getting in the vicinity of temptation. You know what I mean? And, and so um, you decide ahead of time what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Often in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the moment, unless we've made a decision ahead of time, you know what happens? We fall. We fail. So A is be aware. We're talking about able. You are able through the power of Jesus. Here's the letter B, Bible. You need to use the Bible. Jesus used the Bible to combat temptation. Reading the Bible and memorizing Scripture is the most powerful tool to fight temptation. The most powerful tool you can uh, put in your arsenal is the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 11, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You want to have the ability to overcome. You want to have the ability to overcome temptation, to face temptation, not to fall to it. Fill your heart, fill your mind with the Bible. Now, let me say this. Often we make excuses for ourselves because of our, because of our schedule. Well, I don't have time to read the Bible. Or I don't enjoy reading. You know, it's interesting. I, I talk to a lot of men that say they don't enjoy reading. And yet, they can tell you every stat from the Atlanta Braves for the last 40 years. They know every player in the NFL for their fantasy football team. Hello, come on, somebody. I'm preaching right now. Somebody needs to get on board with me here. Here's the point. Um, you and I, we often make excuses for ourselves when really, oh, I don't have time. Really, maybe four hours on Facebook, maybe, maybe you could reduce that a little bit. Hello. I'm just saying. And look, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not one of these people that believes you have to read four hours of the Bible a day. You don't have to do that. To be spiritual. Um, I used to think that you had to read five chapters a day minimum or you weren't a good Christian. I have no idea where I got that from. Well, yeah, I do. I got it from preachers that didn't know what they were talking about as I was growing up. And, you know, I used to think, man, if you don't read the Bible every day, oh, no, how unspiritual are you? And then it dawned on me that up until probably the mid-1800s, most people didn't even have a copy of the Bible. How could they read it? Especially if they didn't even know how to read. Now, how did they do it? Do you ever wonder why the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God? Because most of the people in that culture, in that audience, you know how they heard, you know how that they got the word of God? Did they read it? No. They, they couldn't take out their phone and download the, uh, the Bible app. They didn't have that. They couldn't even go down to the bookstore and buy a copy of the Bible. They didn't have multiple translations to, to, t uh, to choose from. You know what they had? There were these giant scrolls that were in the synagogues or the places of worship. And that's the only ones that had Scripture. So you know how they got it? They attended the public reading of Scripture. Church. That's how they got it. Okay? So my point is this. We have tools and technology that you can fill your mind with the Word of God. Take your phone and download the Bible app and play. You know what? I listen. This is, this, I'll tell you how much you can do this. Driving back and forth uh, to the church here for prayer, we had 6 in the morning, noon, and 6 in the evening. So I'm driving back and forth a lot. And uh, do you know I listened to like five books of the Bible this week just on my phone driving back and forth? And I didn't even listen to it the entire time. I have to listen to sports talk radio too. I mean, you know, that, I'm just saying, you know. And so my point is this. Don't make excuses. We all have the same amount of time. It's just that we choose to fill it with whatever we want. And so you've got, I promise you, You've got 10 or 15 minutes a day to listen to the Bible, to read it, to pray. You've got that much time, I promise you. So get the Bible in your life. A, B, L. We're talking about able. You are able. What does the word letter L stand for? It stands for love. When Jesus faced temptation, he recalled the love of the Father and the fellowship and community he had with the Father. Now, now notice what he did. He, he taught with the Father and Jesus being the second person of the Trinity, he knew the power 
of dynamic fellowship. Some people say, well, God created man because he was lonely. No, he was not. God didn't have any needs. He did it because of his love. Uh, He had perfect fellowship among the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. They perfectly fellowship. They perfectly love one another. And so when Jesus was faced with temptation, he focused on God's love. When you and I focus on God's love and grace, we can overcome the temptation in our life. Uh, So so to do this, I want to give you two theological principles. Now, I know that most of you have probably never been to Bible college or to seminary. I have. I spent a whole lot of money, and I'm going to give you a partial seminary education for free. Uh, For free. All right? Some of you are like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it costs a whole lot of money to learn these two words, all right? But I'm going to teach them to you this morning for free, and you're going to leave here today, and you're going to say, I learned something today. Uh, You know, they need to start paying me when I start coming to that church because I'm telling you, I got some knowledge about the Bible. Let Let me give you the two words, propitiation and expiation. Propitiation and expiation. Now stop snoozing when I said those words. These words are very exciting. They may not sound exciting, but I'm going to tell you what they mean. And what they mean is very exciting. The word propitiation, think of it this way. The prefix pro means for. So propitiation. It is for me. When Jesus died for you and me, he took God's judgment for us. And this appeased God, and now God is for us. That will help you when you start thinking about this, that even when you're tempted, God's for you. That'll change your relationship with God. Oh, I struggle with this. God, I'm so weak. God's for you. God is on your side. God is for you. I heard one preacher say it this way. At the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, it was God with us. At the crucifixion, it was God for us. And at the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, it was God in us. And the good news is, ladies and gentlemen, that God is with you, and he is for you, and he is in you. That's good news. Now, now why is that important? Because you need to understand that just because you're tempted doesn't mean that you're bad or broken or that God hates you. God's for you. He's on your side. That's the word propitiation. And then the word expiation, the, word, the, the prefix ex means out of or from, which means this. God removed the penalty of sin from you. That's good news. And so he is for me, and he's removed the penalty from me. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. That's why. And the good news is that when I think about the love of God uh, and what God did for me, God cleared my record and made it as if it never, ever, ever existed. Well, when I start thinking about that, you know what happens? I handle temptation better. But he didn't just think about the the love of the Father, but I want you to also see that he thought about community that he had with the, the, the Holy Spirit and the Father and himself. So when you and I, if we want to overcome temptation, listen, and listen, I want to say this for all of our folks that join us online every week. When it's possible, look, the online ministry is legitimate and it is a legitimate way to connect with our church. We have people that connect from all over the United States. Um, And and I'll I'll say this. One of the great things about being in person, by the way, the word church, it means gathering, the gathering. It's the gathering of people. Is that when you gather together, you see other people and they can spur you on. And they can encourage you. Now, here's the temptation. Um, There are people that are unable to come because of their health. They're shut in. There are people that are unable to come because of their work schedule. Um, There are people that are unable to come when they're out of town. And these are all very, very important things. And once again, we're so glad that you join us and are connected with us. 
But you know what the temptation is? And I, I'm just talking to our online audience. You know what the temptation is? It's to get comfortable. Oh, you know, I'll just do church in my pajamas today. And I'm not against you wearing pajamas when you're watching this. I'm just simply saying, if we're not careful, we will miss one of the most dynamic aspects of the Christian life, which is Christian community. And you cannot have community by yourself. And one of the beauties of coming to church is how that we are able to bear each other's burdens and how that we're able to fellowship and to encourage each other. Let me just read you a couple passages. Uh, Galatians 6, 2. Share each other's troubles and problems. You bear up with each other. Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not neglect our church meetings as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. He says it's urgent. It's important. And then Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. And let me just say this. The danger of disconnecting from small groups and from church, you know what the danger is? It's that you fall alone. And when you suddenly begin to get out, you know what I've seen happen? And I cannot tell you the thousands of times that I've seen this in my ministry. People that they just kind of disconnect for various reasons. Some of them are good excuses and some are not. But they disconnect and what happens is they start to fall away. I don't mean they don't love God anymore. I'm just simply saying that their relationship with God begins to suffer. They start to fall away. You know what happens? Inevitably, I've seen this happen so many times. Well, you know, I hadn't been there in so long and nobody reached out to me and nobody, they just act like they did not care. You know what happened? You became disconnected. It's not that people don't love you or think about you, but if you haven't been around, they're not going to think about it a lot of times. And my point is this. We must think about the love of God. A, B, L, and then this is the last letter, E, the word engage. You've got to engage with one another. Jesus engaged the Father. And it's, in, it's tempting to avoid God when we sin. Let, let me say that again. It's tempting when we sin, we don't want to pray. You ever notice that? It's been true in my life. You do something you know you shouldn't do. I don't want to pray. I don't want to read the Bible. Like, oh, God, I'm so embarrassed about that. And do you know that that is the exact time we should pray? That is the exact time we should engage with God. But it's really tempting to disengage. But listen to 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. Aren't you glad God's faithful? He's faithful to love us. He's faithful to forgive us. He's faithful to keep us in the family. Even when we fail, even when we blow it, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. That is how you are able to overcome temptation. I, I just, I'm aware of my temptation, of my weakness. I use the Bible to help me combat that temptation. I think about the love of God and the love of community and others that can help me uh, to succeed and I engage. I engage God even when I sin, even when I blow it. And when I do, God promises that I can overcome. Heavenly Father, help us today to overcome. Because you said we're able. The same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave is in us. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us today. Before I finish my prayer, maybe there are some that you don't even know how to begin this because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I want to just encourage you online and in the room, if you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's very simple. God loves you more than you can imagine. 
He knows you better than anyone. He knows your failures, your shortcomings. He knows everything about you, and yet he loves you more than anyone. And so you need to receive him. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in faith, we stop depending on our goodness, our efforts, and we depend on Jesus. And you can pray something like this. You don't have to understand theology. You just need to know that God loves you and that Jesus died in your place. You can pray something like this. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I invite you into my life. I believe that you are the Savior of the world, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you will save me if I ask. And so I'm asking right now that you become my Savior. If today you prayed that prayer in the room, please take the next step card, the blue card of the seat in front of you. Put your name on there. Check that you prayed to receive Christ. Last week we had someone do that right here in the service. And almost every week we have people either online or in the service that do that. And so pray to receive Jesus today. If you did, let us know. Check online that you prayed to receive Christ today. Or maybe today you'd say, Pastor, you know, this message was very helpful for me today. It kind of hit me where I live. There are some temptations that I have and and it doesn't matter what it is. But I'm, I'm... I'm dealing with temptation, and I want you to pray that God would give me the the belief, the understanding that I'm able through Jesus to overcome this. Would you just raise your hand, anybody like that in the room today? A lot of folks. God bless you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that received Christ today, and I thank you for every one of us that needed this message to remind ourselves that through Jesus we're able. And I pray that you'd help us to do that today, to trust you. And uh, we'll thank you for what you do. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.